called a peculiar people. What did God mean by this? It, it's ever since time began, he has looked for that peculiar people, that ones that he could count on. And really what ultimately it, it melts down to is God's elect and, uh, and, and his church. Open your Bibles, if you would, to one of the smallest books in the Bible, Titus, right after Timothy, the book of Titus. And um, I, I want you to know this word peculiar uh, doesn't translate in the Greek. It means one's own, or it means being beyond. Now, that's being beyond what one would expect. That means really loyal people. Uh, in, in the word peculiar in the Greek, which is, which is uh, pronounced um, periosias uh, in the Greek. And in the Hebrew, uh, it, um, it would mean, uh, it's sigala, and it means closely shut up. Closely shut up in the sense that God protects it as precious, like you would take a precious jewel and you would shut it up so no one could bother it so no one could take it or handle it. In other words, it's cared for. So when we say a peculiar people, God's talking about a peculiar people that he shuts up to oversee, to see, look into, to protect, and to take care of. So as usual, you get just a little more from the languages than perhaps peculiar in English could mean many things. It could mean you're just a peculiar individual, you know, maybe something a little bit wrong, but not in the Greek or the Hebrew. It means you're precious in God's eye and that you're watched over. Don't, don't overlook that seagull in the Hebrew. It means really cared for, precious. You might even understand the parable that Christ would speak if a man find a field that has a precious uh, thing in it. He buys the whole field to receive that, which is the word of God. Nothing more precious than the Word of God. Why? It gives you eternal life. It gives you blessings. And um, the Father uh, cares then for his own. So, book of Titus, chapter 2. Let's, with that word of wisdom from our Father, and uh, pick it up with verse 8, if we may. And it reads, these are the things that you're to see that you acquire, that you hold to. Sound speech. No, stick with God's word. That's sound. That cannot be condemned. That he that, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. In other words, your credibility is impeccable. Your credentials are impeccable. If you're teaching, you can document what you say. Always be able to do that too. If you plant a seed, be able to document it. That's the end of the story. Okay. That, that seals the case, and it, it makes you peculiar. It makes you different than many people are. It makes you a jewel in the master's crown. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. In other words, objecting to nonsense, okay? Or... or um, uh, things that are frivolous, that uh, mean nothing, okay? Uh, if, if, the, if your boss says a certain thing, well, pretty well accept that if you can. Ten, not pearling, that's to say no, no, no stealing here, okay? But, but showing all good fidelity, that's to say um, convincingly with uh, faith, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That, that you can carry and wear that truth and that doctrine <clears throat> and be a teacher of it. And that, that's what being of sound doctrine means. Not the doctrine of men, but the word of your Father that protects you, that shuts you up. And shutting you up means kind of away from the world in your way of thinking in your love for him and his love for you, that he has that personal uh, uh, love for those that are precious to him. And that's exactly what peculiar means. Uh, and, and adorning, in other words, just wearing the very word of God. 
Remember in Jeremiah, the parable of the girdle, where God said, this is my people, I want to wear them like a girdle, the belt. But I, they have turned to such a rotten mess, I don't want them around me. You know, so you, you want to see that that doesn't happen, that you wear that word of God honorably uh, and with respect. 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, that's of sound mind, righteously and godly in this present world. That means even today, even in the flesh body. <clears throat> see that you have those blessings of God. You don't have to wait till heaven to receive rewards. God has them for you. They show. And other Christians can see it as well as other people can see it. They recognize and they know a child of God when they see one. They're different. They're peculiar. They're set aside. They're shut up and protected by God. 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I read that over in your mind again. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the coming of Him. And um, that, that is quite an interesting verse. That blessed hope is yours. It's for you to hang on to for you to relish, to enjoy. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem, that's to say rescue <clears throat> us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. There's that peculiar people. One, uh, one's own is another way to translate, his. When he calls you his child, because you look for that sound doctrine and you wear it well, you protect your credibility, you document what you say. Nobody can say they're blowing hot air. Why? You can document it in God's word. You can certify it as truth beyond a doubt. And that sets you as a peculiar, a set aside people. And how do you do it? Through the Father and the Son and his word, which is what? The truth. And that truth does, in fact, set you free. Verse 15, these things speak. This is what you teach and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Don't let anybody slight you for teaching the truth. In other words, don't let it get to you. Doesn't matter. Truth is truth and God loves it. God blesses you. So what do you care what somebody might say? Because someone that is against the word is definitely going to speak against it. So pray for them, but you hang on to that truth. Don't let somebody slight you, that it would upset you, that would prevent you from sharing this teach you, this speak you, the truth. And God then set you aside as that peculiar people. And um, naturally, in the beginning, this had to do with the house of Israel. Do you know what he's quoting here? Exodus. Let's go there. The great book of Exodus in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to pick it up with verse 3. This is where Moses was being instructed by Almighty God concerning the children of Israel. And Moses went up into, unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. This is what I want you to say for him. He had just freed them from Egypt. He had just parted the Red Sea. He had done many things for them. He was feeding them well. Okay. Um, verse 4, you have <clears throat> seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Just like a mother eagle, when one of her little ones are learning to fly, if they begin to fall, she'll swoop under them and pick them up and carry them. And he said, I'll protect you. You're under your own and under my wing as that great eagle. And that also comes from the great 
Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, where he, the overcomers sing that song. He continues, verse 5, Now therefore, if, there's that big word, if you will obey my voice indeed, that's in for a fact, and keep my covenant, that's my contract with you, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. I own everything. It's all mine. I want to share it with you because you are a peculiar treasure. Do you know what he's saying here? I can count on you. I know I can. I see your faith. I see your understanding. And I know if I need someone to take a message, to deliver a message, to do a thing, I can count on you. That's beautiful, beloved. That's God's ministry to his children. That, uh, and here in the Hebrew, it means my own, my very precious treasure own, set up and guarded. I guard it just like with that eagle. Okay. And that's what he does is that that he set you aside. You see, serving God is not a per happen chance thing. It's family. It's that treasure that he feels with that unction toward you. And don't forget what he said. The whole earth is mine. You want me to add some more to that? The whole universe is his. Everything. Verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. You know, again, a holy nation, a nation under God, a nation for God. And this is why it is ever so important here in these end times that we guard and have that safety hook out for those that would go against God that would make it an atheistic, communistic thing or something that did not love Almighty God, then you must be on guard against those things. Why? Because you, you're, that's what causes you to be blessed, is to set that standard and to know. And settle it in your mind. There are no accidents. The United States of America didn't just happen to be a superpower because you all are so pretty, okay? It's because God blesses her that blesses him. And God bless America, and God does bless America. This nation under God. And we know that, and the people know it. The majority of the people. That's what counts. But even in the strain of all that, singling out that thread that is called their peculiar they are set aside. They're protected by God. They are led by God. And it is a calling, beloved, that you can be very proud of, that you can be happy with, because it documents that your Father loves you when you take it very seriously. Let's go to Deuteronomy, if we may. Still here in the Old Testament. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Deuteronomy chapter 26, and it reads, <clears throat> beginning with verse 15, we'll fix this place here, look down from thy holy habitation, speaking to, to the uh, Father, from heaven, and bless thy people Israel and the land which thou hast given us, as thou swearest unto our fathers a land that floweth with milk and honey. And uh, I don't know, are you in a land that flows with milk and honey? Everybody that, you know, if you don't want to work, that I don't care what country you're in, you're, it's not going to be well with you, okay? If, if you're a healthy person, is what I'm saying. Handicapped people doesn't apply. But if you're a healthy person and you want to work, uh, this nation will be good to you, okay? Verse 16, This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. To do what? 
not to hear, not just to listen, but do. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thine soul. The word of God will become paramount that you want to please him because that's where your blessings flow from. That's where your happiness continues. And don't, don't think it only applies to this particular earth age. It applies for the eternity, forever and ever and ever. Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God. You've avowed it. And to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken unto his voice. You've said that. You vowed it. And the Lord hath avouched or he has vowed this, thee this day to be his peculiar people. Once he stands out, his very own that he protects as he has promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. Do you understand the, commission, the condition there? Well, God said he'd just take care of us. No, that's not exactly what he said. He said, I will take care of you as long as you do my commandments. Anytime you stop doing them, that protection is going to fly, slide away from you. You're going to miss it. It's going to be gone. And as long as you do what he uh, instructs. And it's not that simple. What does he want you to do? Love him. And that's that. Verse 19 to complete this chapter. And to make thee high above all nations which he hath made in praise and in name and honor and that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God as he hath spoken. And you know, again, I've as God scattered his people and brought them back to him, you might say, well, how would you find them today? A people that worship God, of course. A people that follow God. You wouldn't, you wouldn't find um, uh, that people in a people that hated God. And, why, and then how could you know that they were happy and blessed? Because if they didn't love God, he wouldn't bless them. You show me a nation that doesn't love God, and I'll show you a nation that's not blessed. You've had, a, you've had a living example of it in world communism. I mean, as a matter of fact, one of the few that's really strictly communist today, I hate to say it, but look at Cuba. And you'll see, that, is it blessed? And, and they even, most of them love God. A lot of them do. But when you try to drive God out, God is not going to bless, period. So always remember that especially it starts here. It branches out to family and then community and then nation. That you, in your prayers, that you lead God because it is a peculiar thing when God protects the people. That's why I think when he said that our gates will always be controlled by us, you don't have to worry about it. He spoke it. He said it. He meant it. And that's exactly the way it is. What a, what a nation to live in and, and what a world to live in for those that love him. It's all the same wherever you are. God protects those that love him. Okay, let's turn at this time to Ezekiel chapter 37. <clears throat> you have all heard that great chapter in this prophecy of Ezekiel where Ezekiel went out and the dry bones, are you all a little warm in here? I'm getting very warm up here, okay? You notice she moves when I said that. Ezekiel 37 has to do with the dry bones, okay? And what, what, what were these dry bones as we read that 37th chapter? It was the whole house of Israel. It's that whole house of Israel. And why were they dry bones? Because they were spiritually deader than a hammer. And how did God say bring them back to life? You bring them back to life by prophesying to them. That means teaching them. And when you teach a people, they will hear the truth, they will absorb it, they will change. And real life, that is to say eternal life, comes into them. And they love the Father who brought that. 
But as you've heard me teach that the house of Israel and the house of Judah are separate now. But there is a time God's going to join them back into one stick. And quite frankly, then through the king, he joins everyone into one, all in one with Christ, with our Father. For I don't care who you are, what country you're in, or anything else, you're one of God's children. And God loves his children. So what we have here is a joining of peculiar people. In this particular chapter, it is <clears throat> the wake-up call. It is prophesying to spiritually dead people. And basically, when you teach, this is what you do. When you share a truth, this is what you do. You enlighten someone that needs truth, that it, it can change their life. So <clears throat> having said that, I want to come to this place where the two houses are joined so that you have a time fix, because it will probably happen in your generation. You need to be aware of it, okay? So Ezekiel 37, let's pick it up with verse 14, if we may. Ezekiel 37, verse 14, and it reads, <clears throat> and shall, this is where he was prophesying, and God continues, they begin to come to life, bone to bone. Verse 14, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Who's, who said they would do this? Father. And he does that through his peculiar people. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. That's to say the 10 tribes when Joseph is mentioned. And uh, so it is that we have, uh, we have a stick with Judah written on it. And we have the house of Israel, but uh, 17, and join them one to another into one stick and they shall become one in thine hand. Hasn't happened yet but it shall. And when the children of the people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? What are you doing? What does this stand for? What does it mean? Verse 19, Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, or you look here, I will take the stick of Joseph, with, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, fellows and will put them with him even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. One kingdom, one United, uh, United States in the country, not, um, not the United States of America. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about one kingdom with one king. We're talking about the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And when both houses are joined back together, well, how are they joined? Kind of get it, don't you? When we get our king, when our king comes, then it joins. And not only that, the whole world joins with us. That, that one eternal life. Verse 20, the sticks whereon thou ridest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. I want them to see it. I want them to experience it. I want them to feel it that they are one people under me, and I love them. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, that's to say non-believers, uh, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And, and let me ask you again, how much of the world is their own land because they're a peculiar people? What did God say earlier? All of it's mine, every land, all of it. 22, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. 
Do you, do you understand this one little thing has confused Bible students coming out the gate from the beginning of time? That you got to know that Judah and Israel are separate. Do, do you know how few Christians know that? They just really don't know. Okay. And they don't realize that. Therefore, they don't see the whole picture of God's peculiar people. But they will be joined back. They certainly will. 23, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols. They're going to worship me. They're going to love me. Nor with their detestable things. Nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places. Doesn't matter where you are. I own it all. Wherein they have uh, sinned and will cleanse them so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. They will be my peculiar people. Meaning again, they're my own. They're mine. And do you know something? That's why he really expects us to love him. Because he loves us. And because of that love, that fathership, that kinship, he being our kinsman redeemer, he was willing to die for us so that he could rescue us. But what he's saying, under Christ, I'm going to bring everybody back together. One more verse, 24. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. This is the offspring of David. Out of the stem of Jesse would come the Messiah. And they all shall have one shepherd, and that shepherd is Christ. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. That's how you tell the difference in God's peculiar people. None of us are perfect, and we don't always get it totally right. We all mess up at times. But all in all, on repentance, we fall back in to his loving hands his loving wing that he protects us and lifts us why does he do that because he loves you he cares about you you're different than any other living being you're you are unique and God created your soul that way because you're a peculiar that means one of his own that he can count on because you stick to that truth. Therefore, he can afford to bless you because you are his own, a peculiar people, his very own, one that is shut up to be protected because it is a precious thing. And in his eyes, you are a precious thing, one he can count on instead of a world running amok. Okay. That's why he loves you. Okay, we're going to return to the New Testament to complete this lecture. We're going to go to 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 2. Returning to what it's all about in the teaching of the New Testament concerning a peculiar people precious in God's eyes. Chapter 2, 1 Peter, verse 1. Uh, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, you get rid of it, and all guile, and hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speakings. Don't want nothing to do with it. I don't want you peculiar people to have anything to do with it. If you can't say something good, keep your mouth shut. That's not to say to speak out against your enemies. We're talking about family here. To As newborn babes, like, like you don't remember yesterday, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That means the, this sincere is unadulterated. I mean, it's the real milk. It's the real thing. Don't, don't go no substitutes here. Have the real thing. Have Father in your life. Have the Holy Spirit in your life that he can touch you and only seek that that is unadulterated. 
Okay, the real truth, the real word. Don't don't buy into some traditions of men. Stay with it. Okay, verse three. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, if you've tasted His love, if you've tasted His blessings, how could you ever want something that was part way? To whom, verse four, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, oh, they refuse him. They don't understand. But chosen of God and precious. They don't understand that love. Man doesn't. They rejected Christ. Crucify him. Nail that thorn of crowns on his head. They rejected him. Verse 5, ye also as living stones, as lively stones, meaning in the Greek, living. You are a living stone also. Why? You have the Holy Spirit in you, God's Spirit. Or built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ at His hand. God loves it. He receives it. Have you noticed this is the second time concerning a pe peculiar people that you were called priest? What does a priest do? Well, he's got work to do. You have a ministry, regardless of what it is. It may not be a ministry like ministering to people from a pulpit or something like that. But in your life, being a blessing to people. You know, so a, a person that people know that if there's problems... You're a peculiar person. You care. Do you understand how valuable that is in this world today? Somebody that cares? Verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. I mean, it's right in there. Behold, I lay in Zion a, corner, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. You'll never be confused if you accept all of God's Word. If you believe upon Him, that cornerstone is Christ, and Christ is the living Word. Not part of it, all of it. And when you accept that, it makes His day. And when you make His day, He's going to make yours. Precious. Elect precious, and he that believeth on Him shall not be confounded. There again is that precious and peculiar people. Seven, unto you therefore, who is he talking to? You. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. He's the king. You know, it's not healthy to reject the king. I mean, you're not batting too good an average if you refuse Christ. Many do, though. Think about it. Verse 8, why we came here, and a stone of stumbling, why? And a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. What word? God's word. Being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed, they're allowed. How could Christ become a stumbling stone? Because people will not study the word and they accept the false Christ. They, Christ himself, because they say they believe in Christ, they stumble when the false Christ comes, when the false rock comes. It's that simple. So Christianity becomes a stumbling block because churchosity does not teach the whole word of the chronological order of events that the doctrine of Christ, the truth, demands. And therefore, they are lacking. And, and that's harmful and hurtful the day he appears. Okay? The day the false one appears is when is the apostasy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt us, beloved. You want to get set for it. When, we see our, when you see some of your own family taken in by this. It's going to hurt. But don't you waver. Don't you weaken. Verse 9. Never forget this verse. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. 
not just common royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, one set aside, my very own peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of, the, out of darkness into his marvelous light. Do you see that light? And the darkness you were in before, when you walk into that brightness, that light, that lights your life, that makes a difference. I don't care what time of the day it is, the light is with you, the truth, God's word, because you are a peculiar people, one protected by God. You don't have to worry, for he is that eagle, he is that son, he is that king, he is a father that owns everything. And he wants your help, he really does as a peculiar person to help him when he brings forth this generation. It's precious to him. Well, I thought we were in the Old Testament. There's nothing old about God. God is the same yesterday, he is today, and he will be forever, okay? And that peculiar people that he chose coming out the gate, they're the same. He can count on them. They're called God's children. They're called a peculiar people. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your written word. We thank you, Father, for the truth. We thank you, Father, for your children, for your, their so, very souls, Father. And may you use us, and may we always be a blessing to you. In Yeshua Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Why? Because the dead must rise first. Meaning what? They're already gone. They're out of here. And then at the trump, we that remain here, uh, we, there, then he would go on and, and uh, say, there is no way that we that are alive can proceed those that are dead. Just a statement meaning they're already gone. How could you proceed them? Okay, so you couldn't. It's just a statement of truth. And so at the last trump, uh, we join them. When... And also, would you tell me, when two are in the field and one is taken, where is the one taken, where does the one taken go, and what happens to the one that is left behind? The one that left behind, Jesus said, how happy I will be to find one still working in my field. And when you read Matthew 24 and Mark 13, it makes it very clear. What does it say? It said, don't let some preacher that comes in my name claiming to be a Christian preacher deceive you. Don't let somebody that comes in my name trick you. For I am not coming back until after the son of perdition stands in the holy place claiming to be God. And, and there um, he's going to catch some. Some are going to be caught with child, meaning what? The first one's taken is taken by Antichrist. And you're going to hear a lot of preachers say, oh, I just want to be the first one taken. A child can read it simply by following the, the um, manner that um, of a literature goes following subject and object and tell you who's taken first. They go with Antichrist. They're seduced by him spiritually. And guess what that gets them if they don't change? That gets them a big write-off out of the book of life as far as the first resurrection is concerned. Richard from Connecticut.
is Revelation 12, 14 telling us that the church in the tribulation will be brought into a place of safety? It tells us that God's election, which is the church actually, will be brought into a place of protection, what? Under Christ, under our standard. God has said they can't harm one hair on your head at that time in Luke chapter 21. And they cannot. So naturally what it says, an eagle will provide the way of safety at that time. And the earth itself, our great land, will help the election. And naturally we know that uh, Satan himself is going to cause to, to, to be delivered up, to be tried. That is simply to say to witness, giving you that opportunity to spread the truth to the world. It's our moment. It's the moment of most Christians to really help the deceived. Uh, Linda from Idaho. Where in the Bible is the story of the handwriting on the wall? Daniel chapter 5, verse 5. One of the funniest places in the Bible. I mean, they have brought out the holy vessels, polished them up, filled them all the way up with hard stuff, and they're drunk. Okay. They are just having a big old knockdown, drag out drunk with the vessels from the temple of God. And all of a sudden, the king sees this hand, just a hand appear, and it writes on the wall. And he began to quake, and his loins turned loose, and he wet all over himself, okay? And uh, I, I think it's funny. I think our father has a sense of humor. He got his attention, and that drunk bunch kind of sobered up pretty quick. Rick from Iowa, where do you find the holy names in the Bible? Well, naturally, to me, the holy names are Hebrew. So you're not going to find them as such as to me as the holy names in English necessarily and be able to recognize them. I want you to take your Strong's Concordance, go to the Hebrew Dictionary, and go to uh, 3070, 3070, okay? And you will have the descriptive names in, uh, of the sacred name. That is to say, uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yari, the God that provides. If you really believe him, if you really trust him, if you really follow him, Yahweh Yari is the sacred name. He says, this is what you call me. Th then there are several names. One of my other favorites is Yahweh Shema. Do you know what that means? That is Yahweh, our precious savior, almighty God, our father. Shema means he's there, he's here. He's come home, he's here for good. Not, not in spirit, but de, but de jure. Uh, de facto is when you take something by force. De jure is when you take it because it's legally yours. Okay. And then, well, it's de jure. He returns. Okay. Uh, 3070, and just read them off there for yourself in your Hebrew dictionary of your Strong's Concordance. And then you can trace them back to where you find them as they're translated into the English Bible. Samantha from Georgia. Would you please explain Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 18? Chapter 1, verse 18 can be a little deceiving because it leads one that doesn't understand Ecclesiastes that it's telling you that wisdom can get you in trouble. And, and uh, that, that could be very uh, confusing if you didn't know which type of wisdom it's talking about. Wisdom to do wrong will get you in a bunch of trouble. And it is talking about wisdom of the world. Uh, let me take a shortcut and say uh, street smarts of, of wickedness, okay? That can get you in trouble. Ecclesiastes is written to the man that walks under the sun. What man walks under the sun? Our flesh bodies. Not your spiritual body, your flesh body. And Ecclesiastes is a book that tells you how to be comfortable, how to be happy in your flesh body. 
That's what it's all about, and it is a precious book. And what it's telling you is the ways of the world, the wisdom of the world, wisdom in Satan's knowledge can get you in trouble. Wisdom in God's knowledge can save you, okay? Uh, Takoa from Georgia. Can God save at the last minute? God can save whenever he chooses, okay? If someone at the very last minute, when uh, when they're of death, when their life is passing before, if they repent and love God and believe, truly believe, you can't con God, God can just reach down and touch them just like that. I'll give you an example. Uh, the thief, the, there were two malefactors hung on each side of Christ. How long had they been malefactors? How long had they been against God, or, or at least not serving God, but crooks, thieves, robbers? And one of them in that last moment cried out. He believed. And God said, Jesus said, This day I will see you in paradise on the right side of the gulf as well, okay? He saved him just like that. So that's not our business in a way. We're, you know, we have to leave salvation up to God. He's the one that does it, okay, through the Son. Sharon from Kansas. I know Jesus will return soon. I am widowed and disabled and needing to plan my estate to accommodate for my future needs. For how long into the future do I need to plan? Forever. Okay, plan. I mean, plan like we could go tomorrow, but plan your finances like you've got to be here forever, okay? Um, you would have some preachers that might tell you, well, honey, you won't need it anymore. Send it all to us. Okay, no. You don't do that. You take care of yourself. And you plan. Don't you ever set a date and say, I don't have to save past this day. You plan forever. You, you use wisdom, darling, okay? You take care of yourself, and you'll do real good. Don't, don't be setting any dates. You set it up where you got her as long as you need it, okay? Enjoy, don't, uh, okay? Pat from Connecticut. Please list the types that will not be in the millennium, uh, the people that refuse to accept the truth regarding the rapture doctrine and those that would rather follow incorrect teaching because of churchosity. Uh, depart from me, I never knew you. Well, that means as far as taking part in the first resurrection. But the millennium is for the sinner. The millennium is for those that never had an opportunity to learn the truth. And there's a lot of them. A lot of people never have a chance to hear the real truth. All around the world, you think about it. And that's why the millennium, that's why God would have to call it the Lord's Day. And that's why that a, a thousand years with God, with God is just, uh, one, that's just one day with Him. It's called the Lord's Day. And that's when He really reaches out and touches all people of all nations, all languages, whereby they have an opportunity to see our Father. And... And this is why, you know, where's your documentation, you might say? Because it, it, this is what throws a lot of people because they don't understand the Greek and it's not translated as it should be. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. It says, the rest of the dead must remain dead for a thousand years. Do you know what it really means? It means uh, everybody's changed into a spiritual body, but they didn't take part in the first resurrection, so their soul is still mortal because a mortal must put on immortality, meaning a soul. Not your spiritual body, your soul must put on immortality, meaning deathlessness or live in eternity. So if they didn't make the first resurrection, they must return, remain spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Until the end of the millennium, whereby they may participate in the second resurrection, if they love the Lord if they follow him, okay? So uh, everyone, there are no types. Everyone that didn't make it will have a chance except those that left their first habitation 
and 7,000, as it's written in Revelation chapter 11, will die in the streets of Jerusalem. And that means a, that means a soul death, fini, blotted out. That's the fallen angels. Uh, Ruth from Florida. Um, I'm a new listener to your program. I really enjoy it. I have uh, just finished reading the New Testament. Something I don't understand in Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Uh, will you explain this to me? I've always been told God loves everyone. Uh, do you think this is a one-time thing, or does God hate other children before him they're born? Uh, please explain. Uh, see, this is when, uh, as it is written, what she's quoting is Romans 9, where it says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. You can read it again in Malachi. In the Old Testament, uh, God hated Esau. And you have to understand there was an earth age before this one. And we were all with God. And God condemned Satan to death there as it is written in, Ecclesi in, in Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 18 and 19. And uh, Jacob, uh, Esau there, he didn't care anything about his heritage. He, did, he didn't care about father. Neither did he in this earth age. But what this earth age is about is a child born innocent. And whether God loves it or hates it, it has the opportunity to overcome, to love the Lord. He sent the Savior. And that can change just like that. But uh, I think probably you learn from today's lecture that God can hate. He can get fed up. And you can't blame him for that. Uh, there's kind of a difference in hate and righteous indignation, okay? Um, Jerry from California, my question is, I know the difference between the six-day creation and the formation of Adam, but explain why Eth ha Adam appears in Genesis 1.27 and in 2.7. Which one is talking about the six-day creation? Because why? Now, go back and read it again. What did God say? And this is the reason you find Eth Ha Adam. This is the Hebrew for saying the man Adam. Because God in that 27th verse said, let us make man in our, including himself, which makes it Eth Ha Adam. It's his son, his only begotten son. Okay, that's why Eth Ha Adam. Because he that was made in God's image is Jesus Christ. Okay? Got it? The, the ethnos was still Adam. Uh, Barbara from Connecticut. Um, Pastor Arnold Murray, my question is, where in the Bible is the verse that we should cry when a child is born into the world and we should rejoice at the passing away? Uh, I think probably you're thinking about that book I said has to do with living in the flesh. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1. We'll, we'll get you started on that study. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1. Richard from Louisiana. I'm confused about the footprint you show that was in rock. I thought in the spirit they, shall, uh, they were weightless, invisible. Boy, was I wrong. Please explain. It was the first earth age. And, and let me ask you something. Why do, how do you think that the fallen angels were able to impregnate woman if they're weightless and, and are a spook? Okay. They're, they have a spirit just like you have a spirit. I have a spirit. I use that spirit. This is, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. I use my spirit to, to uh, expound upon the Word of God wed with the Holy Spirit, hoping that it influences people. Everyone has a spirit, and certainly um, our Father has that spirit. So what, what did they do then? If we're made in their image, what, what did our people eat in the wilderness for 40 years? Really 38, but be that as it may. Manna from heaven. Well, what is manna from heaven? It's angels' food. It's what the angels eat. It sustains these flesh bodies. So there is mass when they are de facto in person. Now, if it's just a spirit, that's a different thing. But uh, they do, there is such a thing as 
when Satan and his angels are cast out to this earth, okay, I guarantee you, you'll be able to see them because they'll physically be here. Gene from Georgia. Some people say there will be no animals in heaven. Please tell us uh, in what book we can find this. Isaiah chapter 11. But they're not, you must remember, their spirit, they're not carnivores, okay? And uh, that's why the one uh, the, that would be vicious here on earth is with maybe like a lamb or a calf or a child playing with a snake Can, they're, because it, it, they're not carnivores nor dangerous. Georgia from uh, California. Who was Cain's wife and where did she come from if Eve was the only woman on the planet? She wasn't. This is why we were asked, I was asked earlier about Etha Adam. Is that on the sixth day, God created all the races. That's why we have multi races here on earth. God created them. He gave them duties to hunt, to fish. And, and he looked, as it is the last verse of that chapter, uh, one, and it was good. God's happy with all the races. That's why he created them. They're his children. But then, after resting the eighth day, he, the seventh day, rather, he found out on the eighth day he didn't have a farmer. And it would be through this one that Christ would come, and he created Eth Ha'adam. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all a lot because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, do you know something that makes Father's Day? You know, he, he doesn't have all that many people that really like to study his Word in depth, in in as it is written in, in the simplicity that Christ brought it. He loves you for that. You make his day, he makes yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, he will always bless you. Most important this, hey, you stay in his word. Every day in his word, even with trouble, it's still a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.